Tonight we're in chapters 14 and 15, so let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 14 at verse 1. And uh, I'll read the first five verses, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Now, some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put them and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Everyone of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, and then comes to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Now, as we look at chapter 14, you might want to note this. Chapter 14 actually contains what would be called two words from the Lord. You actually see that God is going to give to Ezekiel two things to communicate to, to the people. Verses 1 through 11 communicates to the elders of Israel who are caught up in idolatry. And God makes it clear that He will not allow them to inquire of Him and that He's going to judge false prophets. You see that in verses 1 through 11. But verses 12 through 23 makes it clear that Jerusalem is about to be judged and will not be spared even if the most righteous people live there, they're going to be judged. And so that's what we see, and that's how you break down chapter 14. So verses 1 through 11 will speak concerning Israel being caught up with idolatry, and verses 12 through 23 relate to the fact that God is going to bring judgment on them. And so as we look at verses 1 through 3 and begin our study, uh, there are elders who have come and have sat before uh, this prophet, a man by the name of Ezekiel. Now these are the leaders of the nation of Israel, and what they're doing is they're coming before him and they're acting as if they're seeking God's counsel from him. And that's what it says in verse 3, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes uh, them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? And so they're seated before him acting as if they're a people of God, but in reality their hearts are far from him. They're acting as if they want counsel, God's counsel. But God is making it very clear here, and He makes it so in verse 3, that He's not, to, he's not about to give them any direction. He's not going to give them directions, the directions that they are seeking. And the reason is, is because their hearts have been given over to listening to false prophets. Remember in chapter 13, how it said in verse 4, O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the desert. Excuse me, and he goes on in verse 6 to say, They have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Lord. But the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. Have you not seen a futile vision? Have you not spoken false divination? You say, The Lord says, but I haven't spoken. And so what we've had here and what we've been seeing is these people have given themselves over to false words from the Lord. That tells us that their hearts are not right before God. They're willing to and desirous of hearing things that are being said falsely in the name of God. Now, there they are, coming before Ezekiel, seated before him as if they're inquiring of the things of God. Now, how is Ezekiel to know this? Ezekiel doesn't have the ability to read minds. Sometimes you may think that, that people that you admire do have the ability to read minds especially if the person is somebody highly regarded by you. I can remember as a young pastor walking up to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, on one occasion, and Chuck has a way of, of looking through you when he's looking at you. And I remember as, he was, as I was asking him a question, I remember him looking at me, and all of a sudden I started feeling kind of uneasy, and I started thinking, oh, God, may I think pure thoughts, as if Chuck's going to read my mind. It was really one of those odd moments that I've never forgotten. Listen, Ezekiel doesn't have the ability to read minds. 
He doesn't know what's motivating the hearts of these people who are coming before. He, how would he know? How would you know? How would I know? How do you know what somebody is thinking unless the Lord makes it clear to you, unless God reveals it to you? And there are times, by the way, in the New Testament, we see that God will give to us words of knowledge. You see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, how that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the word of knowledge, how God will give to you a supernatural unveiling, a knowledge of something that you under ordinary, under ordinary means wouldn't have knowledge of unless the Lord were to reveal it. And, and there are times that God will give to you, if you have that particular gifting, a word of knowledge where you're able to see something that He's revealing. Well, in the Old Testament, God is speaking to a prophet by the name of Ezekiel. These elders are coming before Him, acting as if they're interested in what God is saying, but God is reading their hearts, and God, as He's reading their hearts, is letting Ezekiel know, listen, I have nothing to say to them, because in reality, they've given themselves over to idolatry. They've given themselves over to false gods, false divination. They've been listening to false prophets, and God has the ability to read them. Remember, as we've been looking at 1 Samuel, remember in chapter 16, remember at verse 7, how that when Eliab had come and stood before Samuel and and, and, and we just saw this recently, how, how Samuel, the, the prophet, had said within himself, surely the Lord's anointed is standing before him. And remember how in verse 7, in first, uh, rather 1 Samuel chapter 16, how the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or the height of his stature. I have refused him, for the Lord doesn't see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so God is looking at the hearts of these people who are seated before Ezekiel, acting as if they're interested in words from God. God knows that they aren't. Proverbs 16, verse 2 says, All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. We can come even with these intentions thinking that they're right when God is looking at the motives of the heart. And there they are before him. And as they're before him, God reveals to Ezekiel these men are given over to idolatry. They're given over entirely to worthless things that cannot help them in time of need, and in doing so, they've rejected God, and they've rejected the love of God and the mercy and compassion of God. It's kind of like what Jonah chapter 2, verse 8 says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And that's what's taking place here. And so God is saying they're coming, but their hearts are filled with idolatry. Verse 3, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. They've got something going within them that you may not be able to see, but Ezekiel, I do see. They're coming and acting as if they want to inquire of me, should I let myself be inquired of by all of them or uh, at all by them. Well, verse 4, therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Now, notice verse 4, they've established idols in their hearts. And so God says, why should I respond to them? Why should I answer them? And why should I direct them? Outwardly, they appear to be righteous, but their hearts are not close to God. Remember Psalm 66, 18. Remember how God there says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. And so, if I regard iniquity, if I set up an idol, if there's something within me that I value more than I value my relationship with God, I'm actually putting something between the Lord and me. And that's why God is saying, Listen, they've got idols in their hearts. Their altar is their heart, and it is set apart for worshiping someone other than me. So I will not respond to them. I will not give to them what they're asking. Notice verse 5, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart. They're estranged from me. Now, it's not that he's going to seize them in the sense of touching their hearts, moving them to a general sense of sorrow, bringing them to repentance. What he's doing is he's seizing their hearts, bringing them to judgment. And as he does so, it's with the intention that as they're aware of how sinful they are, they may very well turn to him, but more than likely will not. 
And so he says in verse 6, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent. Turn away from your idols. Turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man, make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. And they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. And so the Lord begins to speak here, and he says, listen, I have a message, and I want you to see this with me. God's message is this. Repent, turn away from your idols, turn away from your abominations. There needs to be a complete break from your idolatry. If someone is going to have a relationship with God, they come to him and completely cast themselves on his mercy. That's how it works. Sometimes we want to almost bargain with the Lord. I'll give you a little bit of my life at a time. God doesn't require that of us. He's not saying give me a little of yourself at a time. He says give me your entire self completely, one time for all time. Now as you do so, there's a daily dying, there's a daily uh, renewing your relationship with the Lord, there's a daily growth that comes through the process that is called sanctification. There's a, a, a becoming greater in terms of your understanding of the ways of God through fellowshipping with Him in prayer and His Word and, and having relationships with other believers. And so you get saved when you're young and you grow older and you have a process, a lifetime of drawing closer to the Lord. You made that one-time decision for all time. You said, God, I'm going to follow you. There were times that you went well. There were times that you stumbled. But you always consistently remained in Him moving forward through him, and that's what happens. But God didn't say to you, listen, give me part of your life right now. He said, give me your entire life. That's what's interesting to me when, when you read some of the demands of the Lord. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. He didn't say, pick up your cross monthly or yearly or even weekly. He said, pick it up daily and follow me. So commitment to the Lord is something that is a day-by-day -day process that I have. God doesn't say, love me with half of your heart or a quarter of your heart or a percentage of your heart. God says you're to love me with all of your heart, with everything that's within you. That's what God calls us to. He's speaking of a full commitment. And so when it comes to repentance and when God's speaking to the nation of Israel, he says, listen, I want you to completely turn away from idolatry. It's not just something that you do in portions. It's a complete break. It's a complete break from that which keeps you from me, and it's a turning completely to me. In Isaiah, another prophet we find in the Old Testament, in chapter 55, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Return to the Lord. So that's a call that he's giving. That's a call that God gives. And so he's saying, listen, you need to deal with these things. I'm wanting you to be drawn to me, so you need to repent. You need to turn away from your idols. You need to turn away from those things that are abominable before me. Now, in verse 7, he says, For if anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. 
In other words, God has already made clear to you what is important. He has shown you, oh man, what the Lord requires of you. And so what they're to do is they're to turn away from idolatry because idolatry is absolutely forbidden for any who've ever lived in the nation of Israel, even the strangers who come and sojourn there. When God began his relationship with Israel, we know this by just reading the Old Testament. You get into the book of Exodus and you look at God giving his commands. And the very first thing he begins to speak to the nation of Israel about his relationship with him. And he forbids them from having false gods. He forbids them to, from having any god before him or even establishing an idol within their heart. They're not to have that because God says, I'm a jealous God. You're to have a relationship with me completely. So from the very beginning in the life of the nation of Israel, God said, I'm your God. I saved you. I drew you out of idolatry. I'm the one who began this nation through the promises I gave to Abraham. I am your God. You are my people. Follow after me and stay away from idols. So you see that from the very beginning all through the history of the nation of Israel. You even have that in the New Testament in 1 John chapter 5 when John says, little children, stay away from idols. You have it from the old to the new. God is to be worshipped. That's what we Christians are supposed to do. Is we're supposed to love the Lord with all of our hearts. We're supposed to pursue Him with everything that's within us. And we do so because that's how He loves us. And that's what He has done. He's pursued us. It's interesting in verse 8 how he says, I will set my face against that man, make him a sign and a proverb. I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and then you'll know that I'm the Lord. God says, I'm going to set myself against that man until he is completely dealt with. Now, this is consistent with Old Testament teaching. If you take notes, Leviticus in chapter 20, verses 5 and 6 says, I will set my face against the man and against his family. I'll cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech, which is a false god. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. So God from the beginning said, listen, if you pursue false gods, you and I will have no relationship. And that's what he's saying there in verse 8 when he says, I will set myself against him. Now in verse 9, if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people. Even the false prophets who are speaking and their sinful inclinations are used by the Lord. A false prophet may be thinking that he is actually speaking in the name of God when in reality he's not. I mentioned to you guys, I think last week, I, I, I think it was on Wednesday night, hopefully it was, because uh, you may remember this, that there's a, I got a, I got a letter just last week from a, a young person, a young man, a Mormon, who uh, was listening to me on the radio and, and uh, got upset at some of the things that I said, told me I was incorrect in what I was teaching. And so I wrote him a letter in response, and I gave him a few things. Um, he wrote me again. He's going to be my pen pal. <laughs> and I was just reading his letter before I came out, and I was just starting to write a response to him. It amazes me how... We can take Scripture and we can assign meaning to Scriptures based not on what the verse is actually saying, but on two things. One, what somebody else has told us it says, and two, what we want to believe that it says. One of the principles of studying the Word of God is the principle of exegesis, which simply means that you allow the Scripture to speak for itself. There is a philosophy of biblical interpretation that is very simple to remember. When the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. There are times when, as you're reading the Word of God, it very plainly is communicating to you, and you can read it. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That has a pretty plain 
meaning to it. And there are a lot of scriptures that you can read that are very plain. See, I usually don't have problems with the scriptures I don't understand. I have problems with the ones that I do because they speak plainly to my heart. Now, sometimes people will take a word and say, this is from the Lord. That's what false prophets do. And there are people who are inclined to believe what's being said based on the fact that these people are claiming a supernatural knowledge and a supernatural revelation that they say came from God. In the Christian world, there are pseudo-Christian cults that will take Scripture and assign meaning to that passage that was not intended by the author through the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And what happens is you have people who basically take it at face value that the individual who is speaking is giving them the truth. Now, there is an entire body of what is called theology that has been handed down generationally all the way back to those who walked in the Old Testament and into the New. Christian theology has been given to us, established by Jesus Christ as it communicates to us what it means to follow him. He has his apostles who have been inspired by the Spirit of God to write those things that Jesus gave to them to write. And by inspiration, we have the New Testament. There have been, there are essential doctrines that have been handed to us over the ages that are referred to in theological circles as essentials of the faith. In order to be a Christian, they are essential to believe. If you don't believe these things, you can't be a believer. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, that God has revealed himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You need to believe that the Word of God is inspired by God, has been communicated to us by his Spirit. You need to believe that in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, there is but one way. It's the man Jesus Christ, and we are born again of the Spirit when we repent from our sins and communicate to God a sorrow and ask God to forgive us, to enter into our life, and to believe that the Holy Spirit is capable of entering in and making our body the temple of the Spirit of God. These are essentials. There are peripheral things that we can hold to that are, you know, methods of worship that perhaps we feel comfortable with that somebody else may not. So you go to one church and, and they say, you know, we believe that the best way to worship God in song is with a, a hymnal and, and with a, you know, pipe organ and, and uh, a 95-year-old woman with blue hair. We think that that's the way to worship God. I'm not going to argue with them. Why would I? I have no argument with that at all. If, if that's what you, 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 you sense God through the worship, God bless you, and that's good. I have no problem with that. People can have interesting ideas. I, I had somebody who said, I don't want to go to your church. This just was about a month ago. I don't want to go to his church because he doesn't wear a tie when he teaches. And everybody knows that pastors have to wear ties when they teach. And so I look at the gospel, and I look to see what kind of tie Jesus wore so I can wear that one. And, you know, but I don't have a beef with that. If this person wants to go to a place where the anointed man of God wears a tie, that's between them, the Lord, and the tie. <laughs> it matters not to me. I've had people leave this church because we don't have stained glass windows. They said, everybody knows that a good church has a stained glass window. That's just people's preferences. Has nothing to do with theology. It has everything to do with my preference. I'm totally open to that, and so are you. Listen, if a person wants stained glass windows, I happen to think that they're absolutely beautiful. It just doesn't fit us. It's just not how we do, how we do church. There are essentials that make us one in Christ, and there are non-essentials that we can agree to disagree about agreeably. Doesn't matter to me either way. Somebody says, you have to be baptized by throwing them underwater and using a special formula of words. Others say, listen, if they can't get into the water and they want to be baptized, I'll take some water in my hand and drip it on their head. It's the, it's the heart and not the water that cleanses them. It's, it's their faith towards Christ and the blood of Jesus. No, no, you have to have. You're arguing things that are non-essentials. 
The things that matter are who is Jesus Christ? What did Jesus Christ do? So when I told this young man, you aren't a believer. You believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. He gets upset. He has written me and says, You're, all it requires is that you believe in Jesus Christ. No, all that is required is you believe in the true Christ because there are false Christs and there is the true Christ. And you need to know the true Christ. Now, how are you going to know the true Christ if you're reading the Book of Mormon? How are you going to know the true Christ if you're reading Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price? How are you going to know the true Christ if you're not reading God's Word? See, that's the big issue, isn't it? Why is it important to read the Bible? Because Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you something. Now, what does the truth make you? The truth will make you free. Now, if truth makes you free, what does a lie make you? A lie makes you in bondage. And that was the contrast that Jesus established in John 8, 32 through 36. A person who is in sin, Jesus said, is a slave to sin and is not a son in the Father's house, but a son is in the house. Why? Because you know the truth, and the truth has made you free. That is the giant issue of the day that some of you in this room are fully aware of because the essentials of the Word of God are absolutely important to embrace, hold fast, to live by and communicate. That's why God is saying these people are given over to idolatry and false worship. They come and seat themselves before you inquiring of me when in reality I see their hearts and they have altars that have been established to idols and have yielded themselves to false prophets. Therefore, they're really not interested in what God's Word has to say or a word from God because their hearts are not mine. So, if they're pursuing something that is not from me, I'll give to them the desire of their heart because they have an inclination towards error. I will allow them to be in that error and even to be comfortable with it. And that's what's taking place. Now, in the New Testament, if you take note, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 says something very interesting concerning the last days and Antichrist. Antichrist, when you study your New Testament and the Old, Antichrist is the name that we usually refer to this individual who's coming in the last days who's going to present himself instead of Jesus Christ. But there are various names that he's known of in Scripture. He's the little horn and various other names that you find. One of the names that is assigned to him is the lawless one. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now, I want to emphasize something with you. If there's anything that motivates me as a minister, and, and you, you see it sometimes, maybe you see it every time I teach, and sometimes you may wonder, why does he sound so mad? I'm not mad. Crazy, yes. Mad, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not mad. I'm not angry. I'm very serious about some things that comes out when I teach. I mean, that's what you see. That's the passion you see. It's, it's a passion for this. It's that, that I and it's that we as a church, it's that believers, listen, receive the love of the truth. That is my greatest concern for the church, to receive the love of the truth. And I'm telling you why. Because a lot of people don't love truth. They just don't. It, it, to them, it's, well, that's your opinion. I remember on one occasion I was given a Bible study. It was when our church was very new. As a matter of fact, the church was only uh, a few months old. It was in Christmas of 1981. We had a Bible study. I, I gave a service, and in the service in a house, I was sharing, and I said something like this. I said, you know, a lot of us associate Christmas celebrations with 
rituals that we experience in our church. And I said, so, you know, it's not Christmas if we don't have certain things going. And then I remember sharing some things, and I said something like this. I said, I said, some of you have associated, you know, incense and liturgy with truth. And you have to be very careful that you don't confuse those things with the truth of the gospel. You need to know the true Christ. And this is what the Bible says concerning him, and this is why he came, and this is what Christmas is all about. So at the very end of the Bible study, a young woman walks up to me very angry and, and starts confronting me. How dare you, she said. I'll never forget the conversation. How dare you make fun of my religion? How dare you? I said, and what religion is that? She says, I'm a Roman Catholic. I said, when did I say something about Catholics? I said, I didn't say a word about Catholics. She, yes, you did. When did I say that? She said, when you spoke about incense and liturgy, you spoke about Catholics. I said, I have to be honest with you. Catholics aren't the only people who have incense. And they're not the only Christian organization that has uh, liturgy. I said, the Greek Orthodox, Roman Orthodox, uh, various Orthodox, Russian Orthodox have liturgy and they have incense. You missed my point. My point is not Roman Catholicism because I wasn't here to bash Roman Catholics. I said, I was raised a Catholic. I understand where you're coming from on that, and I was not trying to bash a religious system. What I was calling you to was to consider your relationship with Jesus Christ, and this is what God's Word says about that. And I'll never forget her response. She said, that's your opinion. She says, you have an opinion, I have an opinion, and our opinions are equal. And I said, that's why you're wrong. Now, this is going to sound arrogant. Forgive me. It's going to sound arrogant. You can write Mike Callahan at Calvary's. <laughs> that's where you're wrong. I said, I have been reading the Bible and studying the Bible and teaching the Bible for years. You don't even pick it up and ever read it, and if you do, it's, by, it's a hobby and not a habit. So your opinion and mine are not equal whatsoever because I spend time on my knees studying God's Word where you never even pick it up. So it comes, when it comes down to an understanding of the Word of God, you cannot place your understanding of God's Word on an equal power with mine because God has placed me in this position as the pastor teacher and I've been doing this for years where you haven't even been interested in these things for years. Now, that sounds arrogant, forgive me, but that's what I told her because it's true, because it's true. And I can now say that 28 years later, that for 35 years I've been studying and teaching the Word of God. And when somebody says, my opinion's equal to yours, I have to say, have you been teaching and studying for 35 years? Have you been a Christian for 38 well, no. How often do you actually read the Bible? Sometimes. Oh, really? So, would you go to a doctor who sometimes studies? <laughs> would you get on a plane with a pilot who once in a while just feels an inclination to go somewhere? <laughs> I don't think so. And, and, and that, you know, that, 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 that I, I, I feel uncomfortable saying these things this way. Forgive me. I, I'd like to sound nicer, but... I'm not nice. I mean, that's just... <laughs> it's just true. And, and, and where do you get that kind of... Where do you get that... that belief from, that passion from? What we're reading right here? What we're reading right here? That's where that comes from, guys. God says, listen, these people are coming before me acting as if they're interested in the things that I have to say. Should I allow, allow them to inquire of me? Ezekiel, you can't see their heart. I do. Their hearts are far from me. They're caught up in idolatry. They don't care what I have to say. He says, as a matter of fact, they have false teachers who are basically pursuing the inclination of their heart. So I've allowed them to speak, feeling very comfortable in doing so. Because in a New Testament sense, as I quoted out of 2 Thessalonians 2, because they haven't received a love of the truth. Because the inclination of their heart is for error, and, he, and God says, in the last days, and I'm going to allow them to pursue the lie. What's the lie? Well, in the last days, the lie is the Antichrist is presenting himself instead of Christ, and I'm going to allow people to be seduced by that because they're inclined towards that. 
Same thing is true here in the Old Testament. The result, God says, the result of prophesying out of the inclination of their own heart will be judgment. Now, in verse 10, they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. So God's judgment is impartial. It falls equally on the inquirer as well as the prophet. They have equal responsibility. They will bear equal judgment for the sin. Now God's desire is that the nation of Israel return to him and no longer stray. And that's why he's doing what he's doing. Now in verse 12, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beasts, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered, and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on that land and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence to cut off man and beast from it. Now, this is the second message that comes in chapter 14. It's, a, it's a sometime after he gave the first message. This is a new one. And the whole point he's making here, and it's very clear, we see it very easily, just because there are righteous people left in the land doesn't mean judgment isn't going to fall. God is going to deal with the unrighteous even as he has done so in the past. Now, that's something that he's been saying through a, a, a prophet who is, who, is, who is prophesying in the similar time uh, as, uh, as Ezekiel, Jeremiah. He's speaking here concerning this, and, and he's pointing out, and you can see this in verse 13, that there's persistent unfaithfulness. And that has been their consistent sin. And God is saying, I'm tired of your idolatry, and it's time, to, uh, it's time for judgment. When, when he was speaking to Jeremiah in chapter 7, verses 16 through 18 of Jeremiah, he said, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession uh, to me. I'll not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? They, the, the children gather wood. The fathers kindle the fire. Women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. So God had said to Jeremiah, I, I, I don't want you interceding. I'm going to judge them. And God's saying the same thing to Ezekiel. This is what's going to happen. And he uses these men that are legendary in their righteousness as examples, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Every one of those men are well known for the faith, Noah and Daniel and, and Job, uh, because in Scripture, even Daniel, who was a contemporary of Ezekiel, is well known as being a very holy man. They are known for faith in their walks with God. And so that's what's taking place. So God is saying, listen, I'm going to bring a fourfold judgment on the land. Famine, evil beasts, sword, and pestilence will come upon them. Now, people may have thought that because there are righteous people amongst them that God would withhold his judgment, and God is saying that's not going to happen. Israel is beyond God listening to any intercession on her behalf. 
Now again, Noah, Daniel, and Job were well known as intercessors and righteous men. Noah and his family were spared. Daniel was famously righteous. But Job's family died. And so the point he's making is, I spare some, but many perish. Even though they have great communion with me, judgment is going to fall. The land is going to be devastated. And that's the point he's making. In verse 22, Behold, there shall be left in it a remnant who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it. And they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause that I have done in it, says the Lord God. Now, this is interesting. When I was reading this, my initial response, and I bet yours may be similar, was, oh, God is going to bring out this remnant. He's already spoken concerning that earlier chapters that there would be a remnant. This must be the remnant that he's referring to. But God says something here that you have to look at. Verse 23, they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause. Now, wait a minute. Who is he speaking about here? Let me tell you who he's speaking about. He's not speaking about a righteous remnant. What he's saying is this. When Babylon comes, as they do, into Jerusalem, as they eventually do, they are going to destroy the city. They are going to just rampage through the land. They are going to take captives. The captives will be brought back to Babylon. Remember, Ezekiel is in Babylon. He is not in Israel. He's in Babylon. And so what, what God is saying is this. He says, there will be judgment that comes. There will be people who are removed, a remnant that will be taken from Israel and brought into Babylon. But you're going to see them. Now notice how he says it in verse 22. Surely they will come out to you and you will see their ways and their doings. He's going to see their evil lives. These people who are brought into Babylon are evil. And he's going to say, and God is saying, when you see how evil they are when they're brought in, you see their attitudes, you see the way they speak, the way they are, the things that they believe in, the, the things that they're doing, you're going to know that I was right in bringing judgment. When you see how evil they are, and that will comfort your heart. And they will be living examples to the captives who are there in Babylon who when these evil people come as they're taken captive and the evilness of their life is, is, is shown, even the people there in Babylon will say, God was right in bringing judgment in the way that he did just by looking at how evil these people are. Now, we only have eight verses. Let's look at them very briefly here in chapter 15. It's a parable. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch, which is among the trees of the forest, is wood taken from it to make any object? Or can men make a peg from it to hang any vessel on? Instead, it's thrown into the, a fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it, and its middle is burned. Is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less will it uh, be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it's burned. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire, but another fire shall devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. Thus I will make the land desolate because they have persisted in unfaithfulness, says the Lord God. This is called the parable of the vine. God is simply making it very clear, and we just read it, and it's easy to see that, that God is going to judge them. Now, all you need to remember is that the grapevine is an ancient symbol for the nation of Israel. It's one of the symbols that represents the nation that you see in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. 
There it says, the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, springs flowing from the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. It's one of the seven fruits of Israel. And so the nation of Israel is symbolized in the Old as well as the New Testament by the vine. As a matter of fact, if you were to open up the Israeli uh, Department of Tourism, if you just were to Google that, Israeli uh, tourism. You'll a page will open, and when the page is open, there's a picture of two men carrying a cluster of grapes. To this day, grapes are symbolic of the nation of Israel, to this very day. And so this is a picture of the nation of Israel. He's talking about a grapevine. So God is using this vine because it's useful. Now here's, here's, here's the practical application. It's useful for one thing. The grapevine is useful for one thing, and that is producing fruit. That's what it's useful for. Because any of us, and I'm, I'm assuming all of us, because we're Californians, we've, we, we're very familiar with grapevines. You know, my grandmother had grapevines. You know, and, and, and I would go to the grapevines in, uh, when it was in season, and um, I, I still remember as a little boy going up to the grapevines and, and picking off grapes right off those vines, and you go and wash them and eat them fresh fruit, but they, they go dormant. And the vine itself is just, you know what the vines are like. I mean, you don't look at that saying, man, I'd like to make a table out of that, because the grapevines aren't used for that. You can't use that. If you cut them and dry them out, they're useful for nothing. That's what he's saying. He said, do you cut off a vine and, and use it as a peg to hang kettles from? Of course you don't. Well, why not? Because it's brittle. It's of no value. So what do you use it for, God says? Well, you use it for kindling because once it's produced the fruit, it's useless for anything else. And so what do you have to do? You have to cut down all of the vines and then they, the next season, once again, they grow and then you have vines again and then you cut them down. And so what do you use them for? Well, you use them for kindling. Why? Well, because the grapevine carries within it uh, whatever the moisture is that's within it, alcohol of some sort, whatever it ferments, it's very good for lighting fires. That's why if you were to light a, a vineyard on fire, that thing will go up instantly. It'll explode because it's so, so, uh, so ready to explode. And that's the point that God is making here. He's saying the nation of Israel had one purpose. The purpose was to produce fruit, but it didn't. Instead of producing fruit, it's good for nothing except for burning. And God is saying, and I'm bringing judgment on this nation. I'm bringing judgment on the nation because the nation has been unfaithful. The nation did not produce fruit. Isaiah, in chapter 5, says something similar. If you take notes, it's verses 1 through 7. Let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones, planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. It shall be burned and break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they uh, rain uh, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is a house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. The vine belonged to God. It didn't produce fruit. He sought out fruit, but he found none. And because he found none, he brought judgment because of unfaithfulness. And unless they come into relationship with him, they will never produce any fruit. In closing, Jesus made the same kind of comment in John 15. 
But instead of Israel being the vine, remember what he said? He said, I am the true vine. Israel is not the true vine. Jesus himself is. And Jesus' intent is for those who are in him, is for those who are in him to bring forth fruit. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament is the vine of the Lord. But the problem is, is they're not producing fruit. So God says, because you don't produce fruit, I have to bring judgment. The only way for them to bring forth fruit is for them to be connected to the true vine. And the same is true for us, guys. God's desire, as I read the Bible, and I'm getting more and more certain about these things every time I read it, is for us to have lives that produce fruit in Him, to be in Him deeply and to be rooted and grounded in Christ and to drink deeply of the water of life. One of the things about fruit that we need to remember is fruit is good, but it's always meant for somebody else. It's meant for somebody else. A fruit tree produces fruit not for itself. I have orange trees in the backyard. I have tangerine trees, various fruit trees. And they blossom and they produce beautiful fruit. But the tree doesn't eat it. You don't see it picking the tangerine and eating it because the fruit isn't for itself. The fruit demonstrates that it's alive. The fruit demonstrates that it is deeply, richly embedded in soil, that it's cared for, but the fruit is for others. And the fruit that is produced in your life is an evidence that you're alive in Christ, but it is really, this fruit is for others. And that's why when you're walking with the Lord, people can, in a way, enjoy the fruit that is being produced in you that can produce life in them because the fruit that you have in your life is really intended to feed other people's lives. That's one of the reason why, reasons why we produce fruit because as we produce fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, it's intended to be ministry fruit for others so that when you're loving them, as Jesus would teach us to love one another and as Paul would say that the fruit of the Spirit is love, when we actually are loving Christ and loving one another, then people will say, surely God is amongst you because there's something different about you believers. And it's not what you're always against. It's what you're for. And what you are for is God. And what you are for is one another. And what you are for is you are for people like me to have a relationship with God and others. And what I see in you isn't a constant anger and nitpicky self-righteousness. What I see in you is a gentle, compassionate, understanding love for people like me who are so lost. That's how I got saved. Not by having people pointing their fingers at me saying, oh, how bad you are. Listen, you guys don't know how bad I was. And when someone would tell me how bad I was, I would smile because I'd say, you don't know. You don't know how bad I really am, how evil my heart really is. How could you? You can't see what's inside of me. But I know. And it was not those who would do that, which they did. It was the ones who loved me and accepted me and said, God can do something in you if you let him. Those are the ones who made the impact in my life. That was the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what brought me to Christ. Not by going to a group of people who were so self-righteously right about everything that people like me were so uncomfortable, but by going amongst the people who knew that they weren't worthy and yet they'd been saved and there was a graciousness about them. There was a compassion about them. There was a gentleness about them. There was a welcome, welcoming spirit about them. I didn't know what the word was, but I found out later on it was love, and that's what they had, and that's what we should have, and that's what we do have in Jesus Christ, and we produce fruit.